Okay, folks, welcome to the Critical Fitness Podcast. My name is Antonio, and as of September 2021, I am the CEO, founder, and sole employee of Critical Fitness. Today, we're going to be talking about eccentric training or eccentric training and why you need to switch over to eccentric training. Once again, I'm going to want to go over the different workflow that we're going to be doing or that I'm going to be doing uh, for probably the foreseeable future. Essentially, what I've decided to do is I'm going to do a theme for every week. So in this case, the, the theme is eccentric training. So if you saw that there was a post about it from about a blog, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a blog first, then I'm going to do a podcast. There is also going to be a video accompanying, uh, like a YouTube video accompanying the podcast because... Some people like to watch podcasts. I'm not one of those people, but if you want to watch this, great. It's going to be posted on YouTube. Uh, you can have it in the background or something like that. I will probably also make like a shorter YouTube video, that, that sort of thing, something a little bit more edited, maybe even some clips. But the idea here, though, being is that I'm just going to do a theme for the week, and I'm going to just make out a different group of, uh, just cover the gambit of media so that if you want to consume any content that I'm making about a theme, you have all these different avenues to choose from. Blog, podcast, YouTube video, who knows, maybe I can water it down to reels or TikToks, that type of thing. Now, if you like any of those, you have no excuse to not check out any of my, my content. So like I said, it'll be blog on my website, podcast on Spotify and every platform, YouTube video accompanying for the podcast, and then eventually a YouTube video as well. Today, we're talking about eccentric training and why you need to switch over to it. Part of the reason why I want to do a podcast version is because I don't know that I can really convey how passionate I am about something with just a blog. And I think that's important because, you know, I've been exercising for a long time. I started lifting weights when I was 14 and I'm 29 years old. So I've been lifting weights for essentially longer than I have not been lifting weights. I want to help people leapfrog through a lot of the, the mistakes and just holes in my knowledge that I had, you know, 10, 15 years ago. One of the biggest things that the biggest categories for critical fitness, basically one of the pillars of critical fitness is sustainability. In terms of how can you create a sustainable lifestyle, a sustainable, healthy lifestyle? The reason for that is because there's a lot of people, there's this weird aspect to exercise culture and American culture where people just sort of come and go. They lift weights for a little bit, maybe a year or two, and then they just sort of fall off the wagon. And then maybe they try and get back up again after a couple years. And it's kind of like anything else in life where if you're going to do it, the really the only way this works properly, I'm not going to say like don't exercise at all, but it's kind of an all or nothing thing. So, I mean, if you exercise for a year, great. It's better than not exercising for a year. But you're really not in the long term, you're not doing that much benefit to just pick it up for one year, go to the gym and exercise, go for a run once a year. If anything, you might actually be doing more harm than good because this is a compounding effect. You know, somebody like me, one thing that's kind of strange about me is that people look at me, you know, I'm 210 pounds. I'm not the craziest. I'm not the biggest guy. I'm like an entry level big guy. I like to describe myself as the popcorn size right before unlimited refills. I, I'm not, I'm not huge, but I'm big enough to be big. And one thing that kind of freaks people out is, you know, as of yet, I haven't taken any steroids or anything like that. And also, I even by myself, I'm kind of shocked at how I can maintain the muscle mass that I have without lifting. So for example, this summer, I have mostly just been playing soccer. And as everybody knows, cardio can can be somewhat of a de detriment uh, to your muscle mass overall. There's a lot of different factors. Soccer is more uh, explosive too, so that may not always translate. Uh, but even during quarantine, you know, I didn't have access to the gym. I didn't have a lot of tools at my at my house. I basically just had a 50-pound kettlebell. Or I don't know if I even had that. I didn't have a whole lot. And all I could really do was like push-ups and pull-ups. And then I was running like 10 miles a day. And I didn't get really any smaller. Really nothing changed when I got back to the gym. None of my numbers were really that much lower. And all I can attribute that to is that this is this is what happens when you exercise for more than a decade. If you lift for a long time and you build a, a strong base, 
you're you're basically establishing a baseline for your body. So a lot of people, they will get you know a lot bigger, a lot stronger in a year, and then they will disappear. You know, they'll they'll fall off the bandwagon, and they'll come back, and maybe they'll injure themselves because their tendons are too weak or what have you because they've atrophied in a year, and they thought that they could lift what they could lift a year ago, that type of thing. But maybe they'll get smaller. They're you know they have to go down in like clothing sizes, or maybe the opposite. Maybe they gain weight or what have you. But one of the big things that is very common is people will at least temporarily lose their strength and their size. And I don't. I don't think that I experienced that. Probably there's you know a genetic component, but mostly for two big reasons. One, like I said, because of you know exercising for as long as I have. But another major reason is eccentric training, which is essentially how I've been training almost exclusively for the past probably four years or so. When you start training eccentrically, a lot of different things happen. It changes your body in a bunch of different ways. And we're going to get into all of that in just a moment. But first, Critical Fitness is probably never going to have any sponsors. Maybe we'll see. But part of the advantage that something like Critical Fitness has is that this is an apparel brand. I'm not trying to sell you supplements. I'm not trying to sell you programs. I mean, I might, but most likely I'll just give out programs for free in the future. I'm really just trying to sell apparel that I design that I think looks cool and that a lot of people think looks cool. And what one of the things I like about that is there's really no... Uh, conflict of interest, right? Because I'm not, I'm trying to sell what I think is aesthetically pleasing. Maybe one day I'll have clothing that has some type of advantage, like compression or what have you. But I'm really not trying to sell information. There's really not a lot of conflict of interest. I'm not trying to sell you a book. I'm not trying to sell, like I said, supplements or massage guns or anything like that. The information that I'm giving you is because this is stuff that I'm passionate about. And it's a great way to, essentially, it's a free way for me to market my apparel. But there's really no conflict of of interest. So this kind of just allows me to, you know, gain traction, make content that people hopefully enjoy and everything like that and find useful while I advertise my apparel brand. If you like this content, that means that there's no Patreon. There's, There's no ads. There's nothing like that. The only way to support this content is to go to my website, projectcriticalfitness.com and check out the gear we got, grab some gear, grab some, you know, I've got these t-shirts, these warning t-shirts, the the back of it says warning, burning desire. It's essentially a series of shirts that I've made that look like uh, warnings that you see on the side of like trucks and containers for, you know, uh, flame, uh, flammable or toxic, that type of thing. But then I turned it into some kind of like more like a positive uh, motivational t-shirt. I've got the always moving pattern. I've got hoodies that people are like addicted to, myself included. The hoodies I have are incredible. Uh, Shorts, sports bras, same deal. Women go crazy over these sports bras. So I'm confident that if you look through my website, you will find something that you like. And if you like this content, that is the best way to support me. Find something you like and then, you know, order it. It'll be shipped to you within one to two weeks. And now back to eccentric training. So what are some of the changes that I experienced when I started going to eccentric training? Well, actually, before I even get ahead of myself, let's just answer the question. What is eccentric training? So there's essentially three different types of exercise. There's isometric, concentric, and eccentric. Concentric and eccentric are essentially uh, a subcategory of what's called isotonic. So isometric is when you Essentially, just holding a position. You already know how to do this. If you've ever done a plank, if you ever just hung on a bar or something like that, anytime you just kind of like stationary hold something in front of you or wherever, if you just hold a weight and hold that position, that is isometric. What that means is that your nervous system is communicating with that muscle group to not contract or to lengthen. Pretty straightforward, right? The opposite of isometric would be isotonic. Isotonic means that you are controlling the muscle by lengthening it or by uh, shortening it, by contracting it. Concentric would mean to contract. So in the classic case of like a bicep curl, it means that you're, you're doing the curl. You're pumping that weight up 
that would be the concentric phase. Eccentric phase is when you are slowly lowering the weight. So again, talking about bicep curl, you're just low, letting that weight slowly lower. What's interesting about eccentric, the eccentric phase that people don't really realize, well, there's a bunch of different things they don't realize. The first part is, is that you're pretty much always training the other two modalities. And that's what these are, by the way. These are modalities. The modality of isometric, you're training all the time. You're training it when you're sitting down. Right now, I'm in a sitting position. I am isometrically holding my hip flexors in this space. This is a huge part of the reason why people's butts get weak and, you know, too tough and all that, and they got to get, you know, massages. This is why their hip flexors get too tight, and then they strain them when they go for a run afterwards. You are essentially isometrically holding. In a passive sense, you are isometrically holding in that position. Same thing when you lay down. When you are holding in a position... It's kind of weird. You might not think that you are flexing your muscles, but you are. You are passively uh, flexing those muscles. Even if you're in, you know, if you're laying in the couch and putting weight into the back of that couch, you are still using your flexors. You're still using your hip flexors, your abs, your chest, and all that to pull you a little bit inwards, if not to completely fall over. That would be the isometric that you experience in the day. Concentric is pretty straightforward too. I mean, at a bare minimum, if you're walking, you're pretty much always training the concentric phase. There's always going to be an eccentric component to anything you do. If you jump, that would be the concentric phase when you're going up. And the eccentric phase would be when you're landing and you're trying to, uh, essentially, you're turning that energy into heat. I'm not going to explain that just yet, but essentially when you land, you are absorbing that energy that you just put up into the air and you are absorbing it and your body is turning that into heat. When I say that you're focusing on these, what I mean is that again, you are there is an eccentric phase in almost everything you're doing for the most part, but you're not necessarily focusing on it. And so what happens is your nervous system is primed to focus on those other two modalities. So you're basically already pretty good at them. If you play a sport, you're, you're probably pretty good at the concentric phase. If you play football and you're sprinting, if you play tennis and you're sprinting, you are already pretty good at the exploding forwards. What you are probably not good at is the deceleration component, the slowing down and absorbing the energy that you've just created. The reason why I know that you're probably not good at that is that that is basically one of the biggest reasons why people get injured, is that they can actually create a lot more energy than their body is prepared to reabsorb. That's because essentially what eccentric, eccentric phasing is, is that it's the brakes of your body. It's the slowing down. The analogy that I like to use would be, imagine that you are a car and you don't have hydraulic brakes. Instead, when you want to slow down, you have to go into reverse. So concentric would mean that the wheels are turning forward, and eccentric would mean that the wheels are turning backwards. So anytime you want to slow down because you're, you need to hit a curve or anything like that, in, you know, again, still talking about as if you were a car, in order to not fly off the track and explode, your body has to go into reverse, or the car has to go to reverse. I'm really mixing this analogy up, but hopefully you get the point. It's essentially... It is the reverse motion because the human body doesn't have hydraulic brakes, right? So how does it stop itself? If you, if somebody throws you a heavy ball, how do you prevent that ball from hit? How do you prevent that ball from hitting you? Or uh, if you don't want it to, to smack on the floor, make a lot of noise or break or anything like that, how do you slow that down? Well, essentially you are telling the muscles involved that, they need to lengthen, but in a very controlled way. So again, going back to the bicep curl analogy, when you are lowering the weight slowly, you are allowing those muscles to lengthen, but in a very controlled manner. That is absolutely huge. What I would like to argue is that what most people think of when you think of strength and athleticism is actually the eccentric phase. The reason why I titled the blog the world runs the world revolves around eccentric training is because it's kind of ironic so essentially in the blog i talked about how the word eccentric or eccentric comes from off basically meaning off kilter or off center 
And it, the original point was it to describe in comparison to concentric, which means on center. On, on center, concentric meant what basically was originally it began in uh, astronomy, and it essentially meant that the concentric theory of the solar system or the universe, which is essentially that the Earth is the center of the universe. And eccentric, if you were so basically, it, it back in the day, you. If you believed in, so you can kind of see how this works. Eccentric is like an odd person, right? An eccentric person. Like most people will call me an eccentric because I'm like a crazy person, right? And I do podcasts and I talk for hours and hours and hours. Okay. Most people would call me an eccentric person because what? Because I am off center. But also back in the day, eccentric meant that you didn't believe that the earth was the center of the universe. And obviously the eccentric people of the eccentric theorists turned out to be right. The earth is not the world, the, the solar system doesn't revolve around the earth. We revolve around the solar system, around the, around the sun, and the solar system revolves in the galaxy. And we are very, very far from being the center of the universe. The reason why I think that's so ironic is because we've essentially done the exact same thing with lifting. Concentric phasing is everything in the exercise world. Nobody is talking about how good you are at slowly lowering weights. In fact, when you watch people deadlift, they explode up and then they let go of the bar and they just drop it. Or some people are pretty obnoxious. I've seen people pick up the weight and then throw the weight down for some stupid reason. I don't, I don't, that's some small dick energy shit. I don't, I don't get it. But you get the point is that they are training exclusively the concentric phase, exploding up with, with the weight upwards. And they never really train the lowering the weight. And this is exactly how I like to deadlift. I mean, there are definitely, I'll do the explosive component, but most of the time when I'm training deadlift, I try to pretend like, like it's a piano and I'm placing it down because that's what you think of when you think of strength. When you think of hiring a bunch of big moving guys, would you hire a bunch of big moving guys to take your boxes and throw them across the room? Would you hire these guys if you saw a bunch of, of movers take a piano, deadlift it, walk across the room, and then just drop it and break the piano or break whatever expensive stuff you have? Would you hire people that do that? No, you wouldn't. You don't even really, you probably don't even really think about that as strength, right? You kind of do when you watch the strong men competitors and everything like that. But when you need like real practical strength, picking a person up, you don't think pick a person up, like a fireman picking a person up, and then like, oh, great, they saved the day. And then you watch in sheer horror as they just drop the person on the concrete. No, that wouldn't be real strength. You want that controlled strength. You pick the person up, you gently place them down. Okay, that is actually what you think of a lot of the time when you're thinking of strength. When you think about explosivity, an NFL player being able to sprint forwards, for some reason, we really focus on their ability to explode forwards. And we don't really focus on their ability to stop on a dime or really basically absorb the energy that they've created. The thing that's funny about that is, is that your body is essentially always going to limit you based off of what breaking power it thinks it has. This is actually an extremely common mistake that people make when they're training for sprinting and or for uh, jumping. So in the last couple of years, there's been some research that shows that people who train sprinting backwards, running backwards, will have greater success when they go to retrain sprinting forwards than people who only train sprinting forwards. And the logic for that seems to be that once again, essentially, you, just like the car analogy, when you train going in reverse, you are practicing your braking system. You're practicing your the modality of, of reabsorbing the energy that you have created. And for various different reasons, your body will inhibit your top speed or your greatest exp your your explosivity based off of what it thinks it can reabsorb. You are not you are not sentient of this. But your body, through a, a bunch of different means, muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and then essentially just probably an overarching governor theory type of thing, 
your body will oftentimes inhibit how fast you can go forwards based off of what it thinks you can safely reabsorb. Because remember, you have to stop. I mean, you could, if you're just doing a regular sprint, just sort of slowly let the energy uh, dissipate. But most of the time when you're doing a sport, you need to be able to stop and you're going to have to reabsorb all of that energy uh, that that you just created. And if you can't safely do that, then you're going to get tendonitis. You're going to injure yourself. You're more likely to roll your ankle, that type of thing. And so your body has to be good at reabsorbing all of that energy, which is, again, at the eccentric phase. Same thing goes with jumping. A lot of times people will do silly things like they'll jump on top of a box, they'll do box jumping, and then they will take the steps down. They'll like take a few steps down, which is the exact opposite of what you should be doing because your vertical is oftentimes inhibited by, again, what your body believes it can reabsorb. So if you jump higher and you cannot reabsorb that energy, you're just going to injure yourself. And that's an even more obvious example than, than running forward. If you can jump higher than you can land, you're going to injure yourself. You're going to hurt your meniscus. You're going to get tendonitis. You're going to get you know patellar tendonitis. If you can't reabsorb that, then basically your body goes, you know what? We're not going to uh, go any. We're not going to get any stronger. And and again, um, what the the other bit of evidence that there is towards this theory is that. It is extremely well documented by now the the scenarios of the woman who lifts a tree or a car because of her son is under that type of thing. What almost always happens in those incidences with people who, you know, some woman that is like a twig lifting a car because her son is under up, what almost always happens afterwards is that she has like massive contusions in the and her muscles. Uh, she's torn um, tendons. Typically, they have tons and tons of injuries after they pull off these incredible feats. And it's because, again, their body, the reason why the woman couldn't pick up the car before was not because she didn't have the actual output capabilities. Her nervous system was holding her back because it wanted to protect her from all of those injuries. But then when her son is in it and the adrenaline is going and it's basically a life or death, for whatever reason, our body will then allow us to override that system. The human body can do some incredible things, but again, going to sustainability, if you don't have that ability to be able to uh, reabsorb your own energy, then yeah, you're going to injure yourself. So hopefully I can, you can see why this is really an, a big deal. This is, hopefully you can start to see why I'm very passionate about this. It is a major component of sustainability. Being able to exercise for your whole life with few injuries or no injuries that are catastrophic enough to take you out of exercise for six weeks or so is a major component in sustainability, in the ability to exercise for your whole life. So if that's your goal is to exercise your whole life, then one of the things you need to prepare for is how can you reabsorb the energy that you are outputting? And this is probably the big reason why eccentric training is so good at, quote unquote, bulletproofing your tendons. Reason why I say, quote unquote, is because at this point, it's pretty much all but proven that uh, the eccentric training is better uh, for uh, tendon strength, per se. I should say, this is kind of where it gets kind of complicated, but um, essentially, uh, eccentric training doesn't actually do anything to your tendons or your muscles in the sense of most likely it doesn't make them physically thicker or stronger. That stuff does happen, but it takes a very long time. But it is in the last half of the decade or so been increasingly diagnosed for people that if you have tendonitis, for example, in your Achilles tendon, that you start doing eccentric training. Uh, another one would be if you have tendonitis in your elbows, like golfer's elbow or uh, tennis elbow, oftentimes it could be recommended that you will do some eccentric training. If you have a really bad scenario, um, I just got to give you my classic disclaimer. You are responsible for your own body, so I don't want to hear anybody get coming back to me saying I got injured because I tried eccentric training, I, although I will say that's probably like not going to happen. Uh, but uh, you know, if you've got a really bad case, 
Always consult with a physical therapist, always consult with a doctor, but it is increasingly becoming recommended that uh, you train eccentrically for tendonitis. The reasons why are completely unknown. And this is kind of a kind of a crazy story, but essentially there was a guy named, uh, I'm going to mess up his name, but it was a Hakan Alfredson or something like that. I don't know. He was, uh, I think he was Swiss. And he was a doctor who had severe tendonitis in his Achilles tendon to the point where he was just like absolute agony. And he's like, I need surgery. I need surgery on my Achilles tendon. And for whatever reason, his boss wouldn't let him schedule time to get a, a surgery. So this is absolutely bonkers. What he did was he tried to rupture his own Achilles tendon by performing eccentric loading on it. Because again, intuitively, so you are reabsorbing your own energy. So it's kind of a strange thing because when you are performing eccentric training, you are lengthening uh, the muscle, but then eventually you are also lengthening uh, the tendons as well, but you're doing it in a controlled fashion. Before him, though, before this accident that I'm about to explain, people thought that that would be more damaging to your tendons and more damaging to your muscles, and that's exactly what he thought. So this guy tries to intentionally rupture his Achilles tendon so that he can get the time, go to his boss and be like, look, my tendon is ruptured. Now you have to give me time off for surgery. And to his shock and amazement, uh, he does. It doesn't work. It doesn't te tear his Achilles tendon, and instead it heals. I think this was back in the '90s, and he discovers, whoa! Y instead of he basically discovers that eccentric training can be is hugely beneficial for tendonitis and uh, issues with you know Achilles tendons and probably other tendons uh, throughout the body, like your like your elbow. Oh God. Sorry, folks, spilled a little bit on my table. Again, just side note, I, I have to point out how ridiculous this idea. I just find it so strange. You know, America does not have great health care. We do not have a great health care system. But even in America, it seems pretty extreme that your boss would not let you have time for surgery. That just blows my mind. How bad of a boss do you have to be? to have somebody try to rupture their Achilles tendon so that they can have time for surgery. I mean, that to me, that is just absolutely mind-blowing. But anyway, in so doing, this Hakan Alfredson, we're just going to call him Alfredson, invents the Alfredson protocol, which is what is oftentimes recommended for Achilles tendonitis. And essentially, it's just eccentric loading of your calves, your soleus, and your ankles, essentially. Uh, so uh, just for people who don't know, you know, your calves is pretty obvious. Your soleus, that's the muscle right below your calves that is connected to your Achilles tendon. And yeah, essentially, if you just slowly lower when you're doing calf raises, it can, it can be hugely beneficial in a very short period of time for Achilles tendonitis, probably even plantar fasciitis. At least that's what I've used it for in the past as well. So this has been obviously, you know, that was obviously groundbreaking, right? So, I mean, especially in the last decade, from my understanding, that has been increasingly recommended uh, because, you know, it appears to work. It appears to work really well. I, it works for me extremely well. The, the reason that it works is, again, still largely unknown, but most likely the, the simplest explanation is, going back to what I said, you're just training your body to be able to reabsorb the energy that you have created. You're already good at, at creating energy and outputting energy by exploding forwards. You're already good at holding in a position, but you just haven't really focused on and let your body practice the, the reabsorbing, the reverse motion of anything that you're doing. And so your nervous system isn't as good at that, at regulating you know, your body when you're trying to reabsorb energy. But this is what I mean when I say bulletproof tendons. Yeah, most likely it's not actually making your tendons bigger, thicker, and stronger, like I said. But it has the effects of that. It has the effect of making you stronger in normally compromised positions. So that would be for, again, for sustainability, you are dramatically hindering your ability. I mean, when you talk about this is what they recommend for rehab, 
for me, I pretty much exercise almost exclusively like it's like for prehab, basically. So prehab, if you're not familiar, would essentially just be like when you're doing rehab without having uh, the injury already. And the reason is, is because most of the time when people are going in for physical therapy, they're basically doing the exercises that they just should have been doing all around, right? So if you have a frozen shoulder, a lot of times it's because you have weak rotator cuffs and uh, re uh, weak posterior chain. And essentially, you know, they maybe they've performed surgery on you or they've done some kind of therapy. And now it's time to rebuild that muscle so that you can get back into a good position and hold your shoulders the way that they were supposed to be. So I do that kind of stuff all the time. I'm basically almost always exercising in a prehab sort of manner. If you really want to do prehab, then the next big reason would be uh, that you're essentially getting to the opportunity to be able to strengthen the entire range of motion. So in the instance of, for example, like a bicep curl, uh, there's really not that much range of motion that you'd have to be concerned about, right? Because essentially you are focusing on one muscle, your bicep. Maybe you can work your wrist a little bit by rotating. But for the most part, you're just going straight up and down. But for a compound movement, a big movement, like a squat or a deadlift, this is huge. When you are squatting, oftentimes what happens for people is that they don't really realize it, but they've defaulted to a particular movement pattern. I'm going to talk more about movement patterns in a different episode, but movement patterns uh, are essentially, it's something that you're doing without ever really realizing it. Your body, you know, you don't really know what your body is doing most of the time. It sounds kind of strange and patronizing, but... In reality, you are just a person riding an elephant. You do not really make all of the calculations that go into doing anything, making your heart beat, making your stomach churn. You know, when you go to pick up a cup, like I'm picking this up right now, all I'm doing cognitively, all my conscious is doing is picking a cup up. That's it. I'm just saying, grab this cup. But what I am subliminally doing is I am making a tremendous amount of calculations in terms of how intensely should I squeeze this cup, how intensely should I contract the muscles that are I'm using to lift this cup. These are all things that are going on in the background without me being sentient, without me cognitively controlling them. It would be a huge pain in the ass if I had to control every aspect, every muscle spindle in my hand, in my arms. If I have to be extremely sentient about the entire process, I mean, I wouldn't even be able to talk. I would have to focus so much on my body. And so in this, this the, your, because of this, your body makes what are called movement patterns, which is essentially the process that your body is using. It's a feedback loop. It goes, okay, pick up cup. Okay, this was a successful attempt at picking a cup, so let's just do that again, right? So essentially, your body just starts to default to a same pattern over and over again. There, there's good things and there's bad things about that, right? If you got a good pattern, if you figured some stuff out, especially when you're young, not, not a problem. Your body just knows what to do. This is a big part of what athleticism is, right? So a lot of, you know, when they put Neymar's brain, or he's still alive, but, but when they put Neymar in the fMRI, one of the things they found is that his foot movements were extremely efficient in terms of uh, the part of his brain that was dedicated to it. So he has practiced kicking soccer balls so much that these movement patterns that have developed in his nervous system are extremely efficient, right? And so that way he can dedicate more power, more intellectual power to IQ of the game and that type of thing. So that would be the good side. The bad side would be is, is that you can develop bad movement patterns and not even realize it. And again, I'm going to get all into all of this. And that may have sound like a lot, but there's a lot more to it that I'm going to get into in another video. But let's say you're squatting. One common thing I see about squatting is that people will try to quickly drop down and then quickly explode from the bottom of their squat. When you're trying to do the maximum amount of weight, that makes sense, right? You're basically trying to conserve as much energy as you can. You take a deep breath, you drop down, you explode as quickly as you can. Oftentimes, if it's a lot of weight, it still takes some time, but you try to explode upwards as quickly as you can. What's the problem with that? Well, if you do that long enough, what will typically tend to happen is your big muscles, your quads, for example, will essentially get bigger and stronger without the smaller muscles that you need, like maybe your glute medius, for example. 
your glute medius is what you use to externally rotate, to turn your knees outwards. It's called hip abduction. People get confused about abductors and, but whatever. So it doesn't really matter. Basically, the, the point of it is that you're just, it's what you use to control where your knees are and help control that they get pushed outwards when they need to, or if you need to internally rotate, then did you push them in? But it doesn't really matter. The point is that, that they have good control over where your knees are. And so one thing that you'll see happen is, is that people will get bigger and stronger and their lifts will go up and then some, suddenly they'll hit a plateau. And one of the reasons why is because they don't have the strength anymore to push up while keeping their knees pushed outwards or in the correct spot that they need to be. And so then their knees will cave in as they're pushing up and it can cause you know meniscus injuries, meniscus tears, it can cause knee pain, it can cause patellar pain, it can cause all kinds of different issues. And it can also limit your body's ability to get any stronger. Basically, again, your body is trying to protect you from an injury. And you're also probably just physically too weak. Your quads are going to be stronger. You know, there's a this specific angle that your, your quads are going to be their absolute strongest with. And if you don't have the ability to control your knees as you're pushing upwards, then those quads are just not going to be able to work as, as strong or push as hard as they, as they could. Commonly, you will also hear people have weak hip drive. They can't push their hips uh, as they're forward, as they're as they're going up. And these are things that develop without you ever really realizing it. And a big part of it is, is that if you are training one modality, if you're concentrically exploding, then like I said, those muscles are just going to get bigger. You don't really focus on the way that you're moving and those smaller muscles that you need uh, just don't really develop as much as they should to be able to keep up with those big muscles like your quads. So let's say, for example, we're going to talk about the glute media. So if you train eccentrically, like the way I do, when I squat, I typically try to go down, again, five seconds, maybe 10 seconds, depends on the weight. So as I am lowering myself down, I'm counting one, two, three, four, you know, all the way up to 10. What that means is that I am strengthening the entire range of motion all the way down. And I try to go as deep as I can. I try to go ass to grass. That means the entire time, you know, if, if, if your knees, if you, if you knees buckle inwards when you are slowly lowering, you are going to notice that. It's not like for a second. It's not like for a fraction of a second. You're talking about seconds and it's going to hurt. So you can't do that. And which if basically you have to control where your knees are called knee tracking, you have to control the position of your knees and you have to do this for the entire range of motion. And in the beginning, that might mean that your quads are not being as developed as your hip, as your, uh, as your glute medius, which is fine because in the long term, that is going to be important. Your glute medius, you know, again, the muscles that help you push your knees out is going to be hugely fundamental for increasing your squat. It also means that as you are going down, you're going to notice all these little things in your body because it's a lot more time. You're going to notice if your hips start to shift. You're going to notice if you're favoring one side or the other. These are all things that you wouldn't notice when you're trying to explode as quickly as you can. And when you notice these little hip shifts, like if you're favoring your right side or your left side or that type of thing, you can focus on correcting that on the way down. So essentially, that's I mean that's pretty much what I what I do is that if I have some type of left right imbalance, it's a lot more obvious and I try to as I'm lowering down, make sure my pelvis is in the correct position and really focus on that all all the way down. So not only do I get to strengthen like muscle, the smaller, you know, ancillary muscles that you need for these big lifts, but you also get to focus on the balance of your body. And it makes it makes it much more obvious where your problems may lie, what kind of muscle imbalances you may have. This sort of leads pretty perfectly into the next big reason, which is your mind muscle connection or body awareness. Body awareness is one of the biggest fundamentals, fundamental pillars of critical fitness. I am a huge, huge believer in increasing your body awareness. In the exercise world, you will hear a lot of people telling you to focus on the movement, 
you will hear a lot of people, particularly in the bodybuilding community, to tell you to focus on the muscle. I'm here to tell you that I think that you should probably spend more time focusing on your muscles. That is something that I think that the bodybuilder community has uh, has nailed. And the reason for that is because just like you are primed to focus on concentric phasing or isometric phase uh, or uh, contractions, you are primed to focus on a movement and you are probably not primed to focus on a muscle. There's a lot of advantages to focusing on muscles, and I actually made a whole different video on it. It's called Philosophy and, F and Flexing, and it gets real deep into different reasons as to why you should improve and uh, check out your why you should improve your body awareness. Boy, if if you know, I thought I would be good at this. I thought I would be good at at, at monologuing, but um, sorry for all the uh, stumbling through this, folks. But yeah, again, so the point is, is that body awareness is, is a huge deal. Just like I was just talking about a moment ago about how you can develop muscle pattern, movement patterns without even realizing it. It is extremely important that you try to develop as much body awareness as you can, as you reasonably can. Because again, you are a person riding an elephant and sometimes the elephant makes mistakes and you need to be the type of person that if you want to be exercising your whole life, you need to be the type of person that is aware of the different mistakes that your body may have developed over time without you being uh, sentient of it. When you do anything slowly, you reinforce that movement uh, better, more efficiently. So going back to movement patterns, this kind of this kind of movement patterns and body awareness are kind of uh, linked together pretty well because essentially what a movement pattern is again, like I said, it's something that your body is doing unbeknownst to you. It's reinforcing a movement and or a pattern unbeknownst to you. And body awareness is, of course, you trying to cognitively intervene on certain uh, aspects of your body, and you're never going to be able to hit the limit of this. I should point out that, I mean, when you're talking about the limit of body awareness, one thing I always like to point out is there's like me who, you know, I can tell if I'm running, how my, how if my glutes are engaged or if my meat glute, uh, gluteus medius is too tight. I can, I can tell when I'm walking and when I'm running, I have enough body awareness that I can essentially detect where I'm distributing the weight on my feet at, with every single step, right? I, I'm so, focused on my body that when I walk, I'm literally thinking about, as I'm talking and thinking, I am also thinking about uh, where I'm distributing the weight on my feet, which to a lot of people might sound insane, but again, just like anything else in life, eventually you will hit that point. So that might sound like a lot to you. That might sound like some kind of neurotic insane insanity that you would, with every single step, think about where you are distributing the weight through your feet. But guess what? It gets way crazier. I mean, you get all the way up to like David Blaine and Wim Hof who can consciously slow their heart down. The sky is the limit with body awareness. And you don't ever have to get, I mean, I'm not trying to get to that point where I'm trying to slow my heart down and stuff like that, but you're never going to hit the limit to how much sentient intervention you can add to, to, to your body. But you should have some. You should have when you need to when you, when you need to be able to, to intervene with your body and go, hang on a second, I am moving my hips incorrectly when I walk. You, you, over the course of your life, you need to develop the ability to be aware of that and to be able to intervene uh, in order to be able to maintain a, a sustainable, healthy lifestyle. Because otherwise, if you just let these movement patterns get a hold of you, then they're just going to, they're just going to do that. They're going to get a hold of you and they're going to cause injuries and they're going to wreak havoc on your body. So you need to be able to, at key com times in your life, you need to be able to intervene sentiently. And the way you do that is by moving slowly. This is, this is an absolute fact. Moving slowly helps you retrain your nervous system. This is why if you've ever taken a music class like a piano a piano class, your teacher would always tell you to go slowly. When you do anything in life, be it purely cognitive, be it purely a thought process, be it something physical like playing a piano or going for a run, your body has to develop a neural pattern for that. And it is reinforced the more you do it. If you do something a specific way, your body will keep reinforcing that particular uh, neural pathway. 
This is why people will tell you, so for example, you know, I was a wrestler in high school and they would tell you that if you really want to get something right, uh, you need to practice the exact same thing, uh, movement or what have you, 10,000 times, right? So let's say it's, you know, shooting off the floor or shooting off the mat. You need to practice that exact movement 10,000 times. And if you practice it wrong, then you need to practice it correctly another 10,000 times or more probably because it can be very difficult to unlearn what you have incorrectly taught your body. Interestingly enough, though, if you practice anything slowly, your body has a better chance of making a correct neural pathway, a neural neural pattern. I'm not going to get too much into the specifics of this because it can get really complicated. And also, I, I kind of explained that in the body awareness video. But the long and the short of it is, is that when you move slowly you develop more what's called of your, your myelian, oh, come on, I could do this, my, my, maybe I can't do it. Okay, it's the insulation that you put around your nerve. So essentially, when you go to communicate with a muscle or any part of your, of your uh, body, there has to be insulation wrapped around that nerve called your my, myelin, myelin sheath. Why can't I speak right now? Your myelin sheath. It's a fatty tissue around a nerve. And it's very similar to electrical insulation. So if you've ever seen electrical cables and walls or anything like that, there's a copper wire and then there's rubber insulation around them. This is actually very, very similar to that. The more insulation your body puts around a nerve, the more efficient that neural pathway will be. If you move slowly when you're playing piano, when you're practicing a language, when you are squatting, your body will make more insulation around those nerves than it would if you move quickly. I don't know why. I don't think they, they understand why just yet. But, it's, but it works. Moving slowly reinforces neural pathways better than moving quickly. So let's say you have a bad technique when you're squatting, right? Because of these moving patterns that you didn't really realize. And you want to intervene. You want more hip drive. You want better knee tracking right? Or do you just want to change your technique up? Well, if you want to do that and you want to get that technique better and faster, you should move slowly. And that's what eccentric training is. It's moving slowly. So, so far, the benefits are, like I said, you're, it's, you're teaching your body how to reabsorb the energy that you are creating. You are uh, developing better body awareness. You're bulletproofing your tendons, right? But there's actually, there's a, there's a lot more. So at the beginning of this podcast, I talked about uh, sustainability and about how I can exercise seven days a week. And to some people, when you're first getting started, that sounds like insanity. One of the reasons why that sounds like insanity is because of DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. When you first get started after you, after you lift weights, really sore. Everybody knows about leg day, right? Leg day soreness. Then two day leg day soreness. You think, you know, you haven't, you haven't squatted in a while. And then you squat again. And next thing you know, like the next day, you're like, man, I can barely walk. And then two days later, you can't walk. You're like, your groin is killing you. Your groin muscles are killing you. Your quads are killing you. You know, I've had doms when I was in high school. I had doms so bad. It felt like I was being electrocuted when I, when I would walk. It, it, would, it, it was so bad. It literally felt like I've never been tasered. And it probably wasn't as bad as being tasered, but it kind of felt like I was getting tasered in my quads. Anybody who's ever lifted knows what I'm talking about. That soreness actually primarily comes from the eccentric phase. So like I said, most people are not focusing on the eccentric phase when they're exercising. But there is always an eccentric phase. And primarily when you get this quote unquote lactic acid buildup or what have you, I mean, it, it does get really complicated really quickly. But one of the 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 reasons why you experience DOMS is because of this quote-unquote uh, muscle tears that you're generating when you are uh, training eccentrically. One of the common mistakes you'll hear a lot of uh, people who have not been lifting for a long time is you'll th they'll think that if they aren't getting sore, then it wasn't a good workout. And that's absolutely not true. That is mostly a beginning phase. That's mostly like a one to three years phase where you train, you're getting sore the next day or whatever, but somewhere along the line, you basically just stop getting sore. I don't get sore pretty much at all anymore. I don't experience DOMS basically at all anymore. 
And a lot of that is because of time and because of me exercising for, you know, more than a decade or so. But a lot of that I attribute to my eccentric training. And the reason for that is because when you train uh, eccentrically, you are essentially focusing on the part that gives you, mo that mostly gives you the doms. Okay. And when I first started doing eccentric training, boy, did I have doms like I'd never had before. The first thing I did, and I went way too hard, and I really do not recommend people doing this, but the first thing that I did when I started training eccentrically was I did dumbbell bench press. And I think I counted to like 10. I would did, I did like half the weight that I would normally use for dumbbell uh, bench. And I was counting, I think five, maybe 10 seconds all on the way down. And because, mind you, because it's a lighter weight, a lot of people, this is a good thing to consider, a lot of people, their chest doesn't develop because, again, neural pathways, their triceps were already stronger. They essentially just keep moving in a manner that where their triceps take over. And so their triceps are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and their chest is not getting any stronger because they've essentially just kept moving in, in a manner where their triceps are engaging most of the time. Or maybe it's their shoulders as well. Depends on how you do it. And of course, because I was using lighter weights, I had an easier time focusing the weight into my chest, and I'm pulling my elbows as far apart as possible, and I was counting like 10 seconds on the way down. I trained so hard that day, the first time I did it, and it, this actually kind of happened for the first three weeks, but the first day I did that, I trained so hard, literally people were running up to me at the gym because they thought that I had torn my pec. Because when I, what would happen is, is after my first set or like one of my sets, I put the weights down and I just started like, oh, I just started like curling in and I just started shaking. I was like, ah, oh, because it hurt. So it burned and burned and burned and burned and burned so bad. It burned more than any exercise I have ever had in my entire life. And people were, I'm not joking, people ran up to me like it was, like the, I like I needed medical attention. And they were like, are you okay? Oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, man, I just, <sighs> I was like, bro, I just got a wicked burn, bro. That's all, not, not a big deal. My chest on that day burned and burned. And then the next day, it burned it, it was so sore, it felt like it felt like the world was ending. It was so sore that I, I essentially, like my shoulders, it was pulling my shoulders inwards and it was causing shoulder pain and that type of thing. So that's why I don't recommend going that hard when you first do eccentric training. But the point of what I'm saying is, after I started doing eccentric training, in the beginning, I had doms like an absolute motherfucker. I had never had doms like that in my entire life, and I've never had it uh, that bad since. That was the worst I'd ever experienced in my entire life. Which essentially leads me to the next point, which is that it kind of essentially destroyed, I think it destroyed my doms. I think that I can't really get doms anymore because of, of how much time I've spent training eccentrically. I think that you can get to that point uh, without training eccentrically, but I think it really sped up the process for me. And the reason is, is because, again, you are training the part of your body that is primarily creating DOMS. It's essentially the eccentric phase. It's, it's essentially the part that, again, you're trying to reabsorb all that energy. You're trying to control the lengthening of your muscles. And what happens is, is that essentially you develop more muscle stamina. So stamina, most people, when you think about stamina, you think about... Uh, running, right? You think about doing a, a marathon, you think about doing an ultra marathon, but there's also a muscle stamina component, right? How quickly can your muscles recover? How quickly uh, can you get back out there and do it again? And what I have experienced in my own life is that training eccentrically dramatically increased my muscle stamina. And I think this is a major contributing factor as to why I don't really get sore anymore to the point where when I was in quarantine, like I said earlier, uh, when I was in quarantine for three months or whatever, just like everybody else back in 2020, and I didn't get to squat and I didn't get to do any of the big lifts that I like to do. When I came back, I thought for sure I was going to have serious doms because that's like three or four months without, without lifting. 
not even close. Didn't I had no issue. It was like nothing happened. And I attribute that to, again, the incredible amount of muscle stamina that I have developed over the course of the last, you know, four or five years of using eccentric training. And that muscle stamina, I really believe, translates better uh, to sports and to uh, it helps you translate into other movements a lot easier. Because, again, like I said, this is what you actually think of when you think about athleticism. You don't think – everybody focuses too intensely on the explosive and the concentric phase, but they don't really stop to consider how much of athleticism is being able to reabsorb the energy that you are creating. So, like I said just a moment ago about how when I first started using eccentric training, I was able to uh, get an, the most incredible burn that I've ever gotten with half the weight that I normally use. So this leads me to, I think this might be my final point. Yeah, this is probably my final point. Or I'll say this will be my second to last point. My second to last point would be that essentially, training eccentrically is a much safer way of exercising. And, and I don't mean that just from in injury prevention in the sense of uh, you know being able to track your knees and elbows and your shoulder posture, being able to use better technique. What I mean is that you can go way harder on eccentric training without using heavy weights. In the case of bench press, you don't need a spotter. You can use half the weight. You can get more burn in your chest. And if you fail, you can basically, because it's half the weight of what you're used to, you can kind of just sit there with the weight on your chest, take another breath, maybe if you need, if you need a couple breaths, and you just... Recover for a second and push the weight up and, and get and get back in there, right? Same thing goes with squatting. Same thing goes with dumbbell pressing. I mean, one of the things that I absolutely cannot stand, this shit drives me nuts, is these douchebags at the gym that, you know, they got the sleeves on their elbows and all the shenanigans. And they take the whatever, the, the biggest dumbbells that they can get, 115, 150 pounds. They hop in to the incline bench or whatever in the in next to the dumbbells and they get super hyped up and, like, and then they go and they do a couple reps of their 130 pounds or whichever which by the way i just want to say something i am not that i am not that strong i am not the like strongest person in the gym but i just want to point out i can do most i can do the 130 pounds all that stuff that you see with the with the dumbbells and i choose not to and i i i think this kind of I think this is something that kind of really irritates me about people who focus so much on concentric training is that I can do all of that heavy, all of the, you know, 130 pound. I don't know. I think I've done 150 pound for dumbbells. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I'd have to try it again. I can do that, but I choose not to because I don't want to be the guy who needs a spotter, who needs the sleeves. And then at the end, and this is the thing that blows my mind is that they drop the weights. And then, you know, a lot of times at these gyms, they'll show at the front desk, they'll show a bunch of broken dumbbells from assholes who have bench pressed. Yeah, great. You did it. You bench pressed 130 uh, pound uh, dumbbells, but then you dropped it. You dropped the weights. So are you really strong? Are you actually that strong? Right. So to me, again, a part of the problem here is, is that what you think about strength when you think about it concentrically, it's actually pretty limited because these people, you know, they can take like 130 pounds uh, dumbbells and they can bench them, but then they can't control the weight and then they end up having to uh, drop it and maybe the dumbbell breaks. Um, or, you know, in some cases, they're going to probably get tendonitis in their elbows or they're going to tear their rotator cuff, that type of thing, because they actually aren't that strong. They're basically just really strong in a very specific manner in a very short period of time. But they don't have the strength to actually control 130 pound dumbbells. If you're doing eccentric training, you know, for me, if I'm going to do bench press, I probably would do the, if I do dumbbell bench press, which I'm not a big bench press fan, but if I do dumbbell bench press, the most I would probably do would be at the most probably 85 pound dumbbells. And I would probably count to three to five going down. What does that mean? Well, I can control the weight the whole time and I can completely burn my chest out. I can go as hard as I want to. When you're doing 
close to half the weight of what your one rep max is, you can you can go as hard as you possibly want if you go slowly and, and train eccentrically. You can get go to total failure. And then, because the weight is so much less than what you're accustomed to, you don't have to drop the dumbbells and break them and look like an, like an asshole, right? You can, you, whatever, put them on your legs, or whatever, but you can control it. You can control the weight and you don't need a spotter, right? Because again, you're not in danger. You're using half the weight of your one rep max. And mind you, this will probably also translate to your one rep max uh, in the future for the reasons that I have described before about your body regulating what your output is based off of what it thinks it can reabsorb safely. You can go way, way, way harder when you train eccentric when you train eccentrically. I can do this when you train eccentrically, and you could do it way safer. And I think you look cooler than people who are just constantly focusing on exploding and then dropping the weights and all that stuff. But I know that most people don't. I know that Instagram is all about people exploding and then dropping the weights and all that. The last, the last major reason, and this is basically the one that usually sold people. This is why I start training eccentrically. The reason why you need to start training eccentrically is because you can get bigger and stronger up to three times faster than when you train concentrically exclusively. Again, this makes sense when you actually think about what is strength and what is muscle. It's kind of a confusing thing. Muscle is this concept that is way more... It's a way more confusing idea than people realize. Most people think that muscle is just protein, when in reality, most of it is actually your nervous system. Most of it is, you know, there's, it's kind of, it's really difficult to really pin down what is the muscle. What is an actual muscle? It's kind of like any of the deepest questions in life, like what is time, what is space, what is money, that type of thing. A lot of the simplest questions, most people just sort of take for granted, and they don't really understand that that it's actually a really deep and kind of a weird concept, and muscle would be one of them. Again, you are simply a person riding an elephant. Most of what's going on is your, your nervous system just trying to control your body. So when you talk about, what, so why would you get three times stronger? Why would you get, actually not three times stronger, why would you get stronger three times faster and bigger three times faster when you train eccentrically? Well, they don't fully understand why, but most likely it's probably goes on with the same theme of your nervous system. If you train one modality, you're going to be inhibited by the weakest modality that your body needs. Because like I said, there's three; these three modalities are all crucial for life. You need to be able to isometrically hold. You need to be able to contract muscles. And you need to be able to control lengthen muscles in a controlled manner. So if you focus on concentric training for your entire life, yeah, naturally what's going to happen is your body's going to go, something ain't right here. And then all of a sudden you do eccentric training and out of nowhere your body goes, oh, thank God. Okay, now we finally have developed the neural patterns that we need to be able to control properly this muscle that we are using. I actually would go so far as to say that I think eccentric training is what basically almost all athletes should uh, train for. When I say 80% of people should be training eccentrically, what I mean is this. If you're just exercising for health, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is an open and closed case. You should, be, you should be training almost eccentrically all the time. You should be doing your deadlift slowly. You should be doing your squat slowly. This is what is going to translate to sustainability. This is what's going to translate to muscle stamina, and it's going to help you train for a longer period of time throughout your entire life. If you're an athlete... That can be a little bit more confusing, right? It depends on what kind of athlete you are. If you're a power lifter, yeah, you should definitely train eccentrically uh, for a lot for all the reasons above. <clears throat> but ultimately, what you're competing on is concentric. You're competing on that ability to deadlift very quickly and explode upwards. So you have to do that. You have to do concentric phrases. But if you're like a soccer player or a football player, should you be training eccentrically or should you be con training concentrically? I would argue that when you do your weightlifting, you should be doing almost exclusively eccentric training. One of the things that has always confused me about, you know, the performance branch of fitness is that a lot of times people will train their athletes in a manner that is essentially the exact same way that they play. So, for example, if you're a soccer player, 
they will have them doing these agility drills. They will have them doing these um, like almost like obstacle courses. I, I've seen all kinds of weird kooky cockamamie stuff, but it doesn't really make sense to me because to me, when I see a lot of performance coaches, a lot of what they're doing is essentially training athletes in a manner that they already train. In other words, if you are a soccer player in a game, if you care about winning, you are probably exploding as fast and as hard as you possibly can. You are probably cutting as hard as you possibly can. You are probably exercising as much agility as you possibly can. You're already doing that. So when you go then to your coach in the week, your performance coach, I don't understand why they just have you essentially do the exact same thing, more of the exact same thing, for all of the reasons that I've essentially listed before. When you are exploding or when you are doing really any exercise, you have this movement pattern, this modality that you're already strong in. So if you are a, an athlete, it makes a lot more sense to practice in ways that you are not actually practicing. And that's basically what I live by. You know, one thing that I don't really talk about here uh, on Critical Fitness, but I'm, I've am i been actually hoping to document and do some videos on is, you know, I like to play a lot of soccer. And the one thing that's weird about me is, you know, I didn't play soccer in high school and uh, I didn't grow up on it, but I can keep up with a lot of people and, and I can keep up with a lot of people in a lot of different sports, basically for two reasons. One is I'm kind of big, but mostly I'm really, really fast. I'm, I'm really, really explosive. And this allows me to keep up in a variety of different sports like soccer or basketball. It's amazing how far you can get in a lot of different sports by just being really fast and really strong. Uh, but one of the things that's weird about me is I have never, ever done any speed training ever. And in fact, what I was shocked by is that when I started training eccentrically, I started to become a lot faster. And more importantly, like I said earlier, what you think about athleticism, a big part of it is being able to control, reabsorb that energy and stop on a dime. And that's exactly what happened when I started training eccentrically. Because you are slowing down, you are training different aspects of a range of motion that you're not training before. In the case of like, for example, sports, you might need to be able to laterally cut, right? So in other words, sticking your leg out on one side, maybe you stick your right leg out and you land on your right leg and then you explode off of that and just go uh, horizontally, laterally, right? Well, what's that? Well, a lot of that's going to be like, for example, like I said earlier, your glute medius. A lot of that's going to be your ability to control where your knee is as you reabsorb that energy that you just put. This is a huge part of the reason why people get knee injuries, like meniscus tears, because they don't have the ability to properly control where their knee is and properly reabsorb the energy that they just output in that short period of time. So because I started doing all of that, what I started experiencing is I became way more athletic. I could, I could stop harder and I could run faster, most likely because my body was instinctively more confident in its ability to reabsorb my energy. I became far more explosive. So I don't really understand why people who who basically play sports all the time, when they're done playing that sport, essentially train in the exact same modality that they do uh, you know, when they're, when they're playing their sport. If you change modalities, like you're diversifying your physical po portfolio, you, you will have more success because your body is prepared for situations that you've essentially undertrained in. And this kind of cuts to the very core of are definitions of what is strength, what is athleticism. And those are things that I want to define, and I'm going to make a whole video about talking about these definitions, because definitions is everything. But for now, a big part of the reason why you can be you know, bigger and stronger three times faster with eccentric training, the bigger part is mostly because of... Uh, probably because you are doing a little bit more damage to muscle tissue and things like that in that short run. But in terms of stronger, a big part of it is that it cuts to the core of what does it mean to be stronger, right? Does it mean to be, does, is concentric phase, is that, is that explosive portion of your lift strength? Or is strength the ability to pick something up and then gently place it down? 
when you are training a new modality, when you're training parts of your body that you have un- that are underdeveloped, you are becoming stronger in a new way. And you are making more of this well-rounded idea of strength. The, uh, the idea of strength that you can translate into different sports, into different modalities, be it soccer, be it rock climbing, having more muscle stamina, having more strength in the entire range of motion is going to tr- translate more to more uh, sports and really just more aspects of your life or anything you want to do. And I can tell you from firsthand that I have experienced everything I have talked about. Everything that, that I have talked about here today is a combination of research and then also what I have actually experienced. And I can tell you every single thing that I have listed in this video or in this podcast, I have experienced myself. I became stronger faster. I became stronger in a way that I was not before. I became stronger in my entire range of motion. I had I improved my body awareness. My tendon strength went through the roof, and I and I know now how to rehabilitate different tendon issues that I might have, tendonitis in my elbows, tendonitis in my Achilles tendon, that type of thing. And I became more explosive, and I was able to stop harder when, I was play- when I'm playing sports. Folks, hopefully I have convinced you that you need to switch over to eccentric training. And when I say that you need to switch over to eccentric training, I mean like most of your exercise. I, this is what I'm saying when I say 80%. I mean 80% of people need to switch 80% of their training over to eccentric. Because like I said, you're already doing the other two. You've probably already spent most, you know, if you've been exercising for a year or more, you've probably spent most of your time uh, exercising concentrically. It's time to switch it up and change into a more sustainable manner that has more benefits uh, for, for your life. Folks, if you like this podcast, if you like the content, if you like my clothing, I got to say it again, go check out my website. Go to projectcriticalfitness.com. That's the website as of September 2021. Go to Project Critical Fitness and pick up some swag. I'm telling you guys, I am very, very confident in the products that I have there. I've got duffel bags. The duffel bags are sweet. Uh, A lot of this stuff is using digital printing techniques. These are new. The digital printing technique is probably what's going to consume the market because of how precise and how colorful these images can be. Traditionally, what most people were using would be like vinyl and or uh, screen printing, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. I have stuff that is screen printed as well. But this newer technique of digital printing has a lot of advantages. And the biggest thing is that it can be so sharp and so much more colorful. You can get br- uh, colors so much brighter with digital printing. And a good chunk of the stuff that I have is digital print. So the sports bras, the uh, duffel bags, anything that says light, L-I-T-E, that's all digital printed. The precision that they can put into these images is so great. I'm not wearing my uh, my Italia shirt. I probably should have worn my Italia shirt, but I have this these limited edition tees that are photos of that I took in Italy, one in the Roman Forum and one of the uh, cathedral in Florence. And you can kind of do that with screen printing, but they kind of end up being softer images that don't really translate that well. But with digital printing, you can, I can do it with complete confidence that it is going to look like a photo and they do. And what's nice about these is that this is workout clothing. So it's very porous and light. It's extremely light. That's why it's, I call them the light shirts. They're light to the point that you can basically see through them. But traditionally, you wouldn't have been able to get these very crisp photo images on them. So like I said, folks, I'm constantly designing. I love designing clothing. It's it's one of my biggest passions. And I'm constantly putting new stuff up in there. So just check it out. Go to the website. See what new stuff I got. Because I always got something new. So yeah, I would really appreciate it. Folks. Thank you for listening to the Critical Fitness Podcast. I really hope you start incorporating more eccentric training in your routine. And as always, have a great workout. Let's do one more sticks.